Let's talk about the law of detachment and the law of syllogism. But first, we need to have a quick discussion about notation. Sometimes in geometry, we use abbreviations for things, such as how to abbreviate the hypothesis and the conclusion of a conditional statement. For reasons I don't understand, we call hypothesis P and conclusion Q. I don't know why we chose P and Q. H and C might have made more sense, but P and Q is what we call them. So P is your hypothesis, and then you would put an arrow in between to mean then, and then Q is your conclusion. I think maybe part of the reason we chose P and Q for the hypothesis and conclusion instead of H and C is just that P and Q are alphabetical. So if you have more than one conditional statement that you're dealing with, you can just go in alphabetical order and say that the next hypothesis is R or S and T and so on. So let's go ahead and talk about the law of detachment. It says that if P then Q is a true conditional statement, and if you're given that P is true, then Q must be true. So what does that mean? Basically, it's like saying if you know something, like if you have this conditional statement that says if something, then something, and then you also are given in a different context that the hypothesis is true, then you would be able to use that conditional statement from the beginning to conclude that Q has to be true. It's important to note that this does not guarantee the opposite. In other words, if you know P then Q is true, and then you're given that Q, the conclusion, is true, that doesn't necessarily mean that P, the hypothesis, which is true. Your order here matters. You must be given the hypothesis is true, and that allows you to say that the conclusion of the conditional statement is true. If you're given that the conclusion is true, it may or may not mean that the hypothesis was true. I know that kind of sounds very abstract, so let's take a look at an example. Jared knows that if he misses the practice the day before the game, then he will not be a starting player in the game. That's the P then Q. P is Jared knows if he misses practice the day before the game. That's P. That's the hypothesis. And then he will not be a starting player in the game. That's Q. That's the conclusion. So that first sentence is our given conditional statement. Let's continue reading. Jared missed practice on Tuesday. Therefore, he concludes that he will not be able to start in the game on Wednesday. So what we need to do is identify whether this piece of information is P or Q. Remember that in our original statement, this is P, if he misses practice the day before the game, and this is Q, that he's not going to be a starting player in the game. So our next statement is that Jared missed practice on Tuesday. Does that match to the yellow or to the blue? It matches to the yellow, right? That's talking about missing a practice. So I'm given that P is true. I'm given that the hypothesis is true. So does that mean that this conclusion has to be true? Yeah, it does. That's valid reasoning. That matches the order of what the law of detachment says. So since I was given that the hypothesis was true, Jared missed practice, I'm able to conclude that the conclusion is true. He won't be a starting player in the game on Wednesday. Okay, let's try one that's a little bit more mathematical. If two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. So that's my P. If two angles form a linear pair, that's P. And I'm given Q. Then they are supplementary. So that right there is my conditional statement, P then Q, that I'm starting off with. So now let's read the rest of it and see, was I given P or was I given Q? A and B are supplementary. Does that match to the hypothesis or the conclusion of the original statement? It matches the conclusion, right? The conclusion of the original was they're supplementary, and the statement that I was just given is that A and B are supplementary. That's Q. Does Q guarantee that P is true? If I know the conclusion is true, does that guarantee that the hypothesis was true as well? And the answer is no. This is invalid reasoning based on the law of detachment. We were given the information in the wrong order, and therefore you might be able to provide a counterexample for what was said. It says that angle A and angle B are supplementary, therefore they're a linear pair. Is that a guarantee? No. 
Remember we discussed that supplementary angles may or may not be adjacent, but linear pairs have to be adjacent. So while it's possible that A and B form a linear pair, it's not a guarantee. And that's because we were given the information in the wrong order based on the law of detachment. So this is invalid reasoning. Let's try another one. If it is Monday, then there is school today. So we're just going to assume that that's true. Whatever you're given first, you get to just assume it's true. Monday is my hypothesis, that's P. And school today is Q, that's my conclusion. So let's see if what we're given next is valid or invalid reasoning. There is school today. So it's Monday. Well, those two statements are in the wrong order, right? I was given that the conclusion was true. That doesn't necessarily mean that the hypothesis was true. So this is invalid reasoning. Just because there's school today doesn't necessarily mean it's Monday. It could be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday and still be a school day. So this is invalid based on the law of detachment. Now let's talk about the law of syllogism. It says that if P then Q is true, and if Q then R is true, then P then R is true. What? Right, like that kind of sounds like a totally different language when you read that, so let's break it down. Basically, it's a way of linking two conditional statements together. Notice that the two things that were given in the if part of this, if P then Q is true, and if Q then R is true, both of those statements have a Q. Q is the conclusion of one of the statements, and it's the hypothesis of the other. That makes these two statements linked. It goes from P to Q, and from Q to R. And what the law of syllogism says is that we can basically X out that Q. Since they have it in common, we don't really need it. We can just start with the original hypothesis of P, and end with the final conclusion of R. So really the law of syllogism allows us to go from one conditional statement to another, from P then Q to Q then R, and make an overall conclusion based on combining those two statements. Let's take a look. If a polygon has three sides, then it's a triangle. If a polygon is a triangle, then the sum of its interior angles equals 180 degrees. Well, I see two conditional statements here. I have, if a polygon has three sides, then it's a triangle. That's P and Q. P is yellow, and Q is blue. Now, if I look at my next conditional statement, it starts with the same thing as the previous statement's conclusion. It starts with, if a polygon is a triangle. So that's also Q. Q for this conditional statement is the same as the Q in the previous one. And then I have R to wrap everything up. The sum of the interior angles is 180. So what the law of syllogism tells us is that since these two statements are linked, since the conclusion of one is the hypothesis of the next one, you can basically just get rid of it. And you're left with the original hypothesis, if a polygon has three sides, and the final conclusion. So the statement that can be assumed from the original two statements is, if a polygon has three sides, then the sum of its interior angles is equal to 180 degrees. Let's try another one. And please forgive me because I didn't update the movie that I put in this example from last year. It Chapter 2 came out this time last year. Let's just pretend like we can go see movies. If Jeremy gets all of his homework done tonight, then he'll go to the movies with his friends. If Jeremy goes to the movies with his friends, then he will see It Chapter 2. So again, I have two conditional statements. The first P is that if Jeremy gets all of his homework done tonight, that's the first hypothesis, and the conclusion is Q. He'll go to the movies. And the next hypothesis is the same thing as that conclusion. He'll go to the movies. So those two things are linked. They match. Those are both called Q. And our final conclusion, R, is that he'll see it chapter 2. So according to the law of syllogism, since the hypothesis of one statement is the conclusion of the previous statement, I can get rid of that Q. And my overall conclusion would be the original hypothesis and the final conclusion. If Jeremy gets all of his homework done tonight, then he will go see it chapter two. How about this one? It's a whole bunch of numbers and letters, right? It looks kind of crazy. Let's go ahead and read. 
If the measure of angle A is 36 degrees, that's P, then the measure of angle B is 54 degrees, that's Q. And then I see Q again as my hypothesis of the next statement, angle B is 54 degrees, then angle C measures 126 degrees. So since these two statements are linked, the hypothesis of one is the conclusion of the other, I can just get rid of Q. And my overall conclusion is the original hypothesis and the final conclusion. If the measure of angle A is 36 degrees, then the measure of angle C is 126 degrees. The examples that we've looked at so far have all just been if P then Q and if Q then R, just two conditional statements linked together. But you can actually link as many statements together as you want to, and as long as the conclusion of one statement links to the hypothesis of the next one, you can eliminate all of the linking parts and just state that the original hypothesis and the final conclusion are true. Let's take a look at an example. If Jacqueline doesn't do the laundry today, that's my original P hypothesis, then she won't have an appropriate outfit to wear to her interview tomorrow. That's Q. And then I see Q again for my next hypothesis. If Jacqueline doesn't have an appropriate outfit to wear to the interview, and then I have R. She'll wear casual clothes. Then I see R again as my next hypothesis. If Jacqueline wears casual clothes to her interview, and then I have S, a new conclusion. Her interviewer won't think she's serious about wanting the position. And then I see S again as my next hypothesis. If Jacqueline's interviewer doesn't think she's serious about wanting the position, and then I conclude with T, then she won't get hired. So do you see how each of these statements link one to the next? That the conclusion of one is the hypothesis of the next one? The law of syllogism tells me that I can get rid of all of the linking parts. My overall conclusion for this statement would be if Jacqueline doesn't do the laundry today, then she won't get hired. Let's try one that's a little bit more mathematical. And it's in the wrong order. We need to reorder these statements based on the law of syllogism, and then we'll write the overall conclusion based on those statements. So how am I supposed to figure out what order these go in? Well, really what I need to do is figure out how these statements link to each other. I like to do this with colors, but you can do it however you want to to keep yourself organized. I'm going to go ahead and highlight this first hypothesis in yellow, if angle 1 and angle 2 are supplementary. So I need to go read through the other conclusions and see if I see supplementary as one of the conclusions. And I do, it's right here. So these two statements are linked. This statement must lead to this statement, because this conclusion is the same as this hypothesis. Okay, let's find some other links. I see that this conclusion is their sum is 180. Do I see that as a hypothesis anywhere else? I don't. So that must mean that it's the final conclusion. This must be the last statement because it doesn't link to another hypothesis. Let's keep going. I also have angle 1 and angle 2 form a linear pair. Do I see that anywhere else? I do. I see it right here. So that means these two statements are linked. This conclusion is going to lead to that hypothesis. And then the last thing, it must also be unique, I don't see this uh, opposite rays and common side anywhere else, so since this is a unique hypothesis, it didn't link to any other conclusions, that means this is the first statement. So let's link it all together. If angle 1 and angle 2 are formed from opposite rays and share a common side, then they form a linear pair. Okay, well this pink line is going to lead us to this statement. So that must be statement number 2. If angle 1 and angle 2 form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. And then I can link that conclusion to this hypothesis, because they match. So that must mean that it's statement 3. If angle 1 and angle 2 are supplementary, then their sum is 180 degrees. So my overall conclusion is the original hypothesis and the final conclusion. So what I would write is that if angle 1 and angle 2 are formed from opposite rays and a common sign, then their sum is 180 degrees. Let's try another one like that. Same idea as before, we need to figure out what order these statements go in based on the law of syllogism. So my job is to figure out how are these linked to each other. The first hypothesis I see is that BC is 7 and CD is 7. Do I see that anywhere else as a conclusion? Yeah, I do, it's right here. 
So that means these two statements are linked. This statement will lead to this statement. Let's see what other links we can find. AD is 21. Well, be careful because I see DE is 21. That's not the same thing, right? We got to be specific. AD is 21. Do I see that? Oh, I do. It's right here. So that means these two statements are linked. This statement will lead to this statement. What about AB is 7? I actually don't see that anywhere else. So that is a unique hypothesis. There's no conclusions that match AB is equal to 7, so this must be my starting statement. But let's go ahead and figure out my other links before I label their order. DE is 21, and DE is 21, so those two statements are linked. And then the last one is AE is 42. It doesn't match to anything else, so that must be my final conclusion. So let's put it all together. This must be my first statement, because it had a unique hypothesis that didn't occur as a conclusion anywhere. And then let's see where it leads us. If AB is 7, then BC is 7 and CD is 7. That leads me to this statement, statement number 2. And it tells me then that AD is 21. And that matches down here, so that must be the third statement. And that leads me to DE is 21, which means that this must be my final statement. Which makes sense, because we said that since this was a unique conclusion, it had to be the last statement. So the overall statement that I can write using the law of syllogism for these statements is the original hypothesis and the final conclusion. So I would say that if AB equals 7, then AE equals 42. All right, I want you to pause the video and try this last one on your own. It's about trick-or-treating, which I know is kind of heartbreaking because we might not have trick-or-treating the way that we're used to this year. But let's just pretend like the world is normal and we get to trick-or-treat. So what I need you to do is reorder these statements, figure out which one goes first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and then write the overall conclusion based on these statements. Pause the video and give it a try. Let's see how you did. So I'm going to highlight the ones that match each other. If you get lots of candy, if you get lots of candy. You'll eat too much sugar, eat too much sugar. Go trick-or-treating, go trick-or-treating. Halloween, Halloween. And then I have this statement about getting a stomach ache, which doesn't match to anything else, so it must be my final conclusion. And I have this statement about October 31st, which doesn't match to anything else, so it must be my first hypothesis. So here we go. This must be my first statement. And it leads me to this one, which must be my second statement, which leads to this one, my third statement. And that leads to this one, my fourth statement. And finally, my fifth statement. So using the law of syllogism, the conclusion that you can write based on these statements is that if it's October 31st, then you'll get a stomachache. Before I wrap up this video, I want to tell you why learning the law of detachment and the law of syllogism is so important for this class. We're going to be doing a lot of what's called proofs, which is using what you know to prove other things that you didn't already know. And one way that you're going to do that is using the law of detachment. So the first part of the law of detachment, the if P then Q is a conditional statement, that's basically all of the laws and properties and theorems and definitions and everything that I'm going to teach you along the way. That's all the stuff that you're going to know, all that stuff that's going to be in your brain about what's true in geometry. Then we're going to look at diagrams and figure out, well, can I figure out that a hypothesis from one of these definitions or theorems or something is true? Because if it is true, then I can conclude that the conclusion of that definition or theorem or statement is true. Basically, the law of detachment allows you to apply things that you know to things that you don't. And the law of syllogism allows you to do that multiple times. That you can say, well, this thing is true, which means that other thing has to be true. And since that other thing has to be true, then this other other thing has to be true. It's a way to link all of the knowledge that we're going to learn together to come to a final conclusion. And you can do that as many times as you feel like you need to in order to come to the conclusion that you're asked to prove. So that's everything you need to know about inductive and deductive reasoning, and the law of syllogism and the law of detachment. In our next lesson, we're going to start talking about patterns and how to write conjectures to describe what we see.